Absolutely. And answering a question that came in from one of our viewers about the uh, the size of the ship, Akagi is 260 meters overall length, um, 855 feet. Uh, she was the largest, or Akagi was the largest of the aircraft carriers that um, sank that day um, and fought being uh, just about nine meters longer than the USS Yorktown that we had the privilege to visit and see yesterday and um, in the order of of 13 to 35 meters larger than the other Japanese carriers as well. A massive sight, um, so much that we anticipate being able to see and explore here over the next um, many, many hours on the seafloor to be able to tell the story and honor this place. Okay, I'm looking roughly 090, so in theory, if we move south, uh, we'll go that way. Um. Yep, sounds good. <laughs> All right. Let's try a 30-meter move at 180. Uh, another question from the chat. Uh, what would the main type of plane have been on the Kagi? Was it primarily the Zero, or were there different plane types? Um, would any of our archaeologists or historian team members on the Nautilus or um, on shore be able to help answer that? Yeah, I think that, uh, as, as June mentioned, uh, Kagi had an impressive capacity for aircraft, up to maybe 90 aircraft to be able to be on board at one time. And those are aircraft that are stowed down below and also those on the, on the upper hangar deck. I think if uh, my references are correct, at the time of the Battle of Midway, Akagi carried 18 Nakajima B-5N torpedo bombers. 18 Aichi D3A uh, dive bombers and 24 Mitsubishi A6M Zero fighter aircraft. Shoreside, does that uh, sound right? Back row, we're going to uh, check out here and hand it over to the uh, Master Jake Bonney and Wood the Woods Hole Tito to. Uh, Take Thanks. it from here, so we're just going to take a few minutes off of SPL to uh, let them know what we've seen and what we're doing. Thanks, Hans. And thank just you, everyone. Again, it was an honor and a pleasure to be here. Yes, thank you. It was a, a real honor. Yes. So, um, as Dan and Nia said, we are doing a watch change now, so we are going to be. Um, uh, putting in a different crew of ROV pilots, navigators, video engineers, and communicators. So um, please stay tuned as we transition. And um, thank you again for joining us on this exploration journey um, and seeing what we can see. We'll uh, hope to see you in a few hours if, as this dive continues uh, into the uh, next several hours. What's that for the next several hours? Model of short stop. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. What we what we what we think we're looking at here is that the structure that is to the left, which is sitting at, standing at more upright, would appear to be the forward bulkhead of the hangar. Yeah. After that, and also further left, is the folded over flight deck. Moving to the right, and we've now rotated out of the view, we could clearly see the base of the socket for one of the supports for the flight deck as it projected out towards past the hangar and over the bow. It's right, it's directly next to uh, Bollard. After that, there should be moving forward when we move back towards the bow, we should see potentially the base of the socket for the forward most upright to support for the flight deck as it projected out over the bow as we get closer to the nose. There it is. So now what we can see there, you can clearly see, like in the camera now, that's the, that's the socket, that's the base for that. Up for that sock for that support 
and the two bollards. Right? So the bollards are there. You've got the hatch after that. And once we move again more towards the bow, tip of the bow, we should see, potentially we would hopefully see, the second base or socket for this starboard set of supports for the flight deck. There should be a matching one, of course, on the port side as well. And even further forward, it, it almost looked like we had just a glimpse of two cylindrical objects uh, in the distance. And if there are indeed more teardrop shapes, unless that's distortion from the video, I don't think it is. It don't appear to be completely cylindrical. So if the shape matches, certainly the shape of the base. That's telling as well. But you can also, I mean, just looking down as well, you really are seeing now the very sharp lines of that hull. Yep. Can we tell what the mud line is here? Mud line seems to be roughly water line. Yeah, Looks to be about water line. I think it's a good part of the bow of the mud. Well, what do we actually mean? We move along what we might see. I did see what looked to be when we drifted over there. I saw what I thought was anchor chain. Yeah. We so can, with that, the, the anchor would be there in, 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 in the hog. Check, check. How's it going, Mike? All right, hello everyone. Can y'all hear me okay in the van? Yeah? Sorry. Nice. Um, for our viewers, we just had a watch change here uh, on board the ship in the control van. So if you're interested in hearing or seeing whose voices you're hearing right now, head on over to the Nautilus live site. Um, and you can check out our bios and a little bit about us and our colleagues that we have on shore uh, joining us.
Nav is on comms. Hello, Derek. Hello there. Good afternoon, Derek. Good afternoon. So for all of our viewers around the world and our collaborators ashore, we, we operate a rotating four on eight off watch schedule here on Nautilus, which is what lets us work 24 hours around the clock. Uh, so the four to eight team just came in. They will also be here at 4 a.m and are ready to continue this dive where we have several more watch transitions planned um, on the clock. Nautilus short side. This is perfect. What we've got in view here is, of course, we've got we've got we've got the starboard anchor clearly now still fitting in its withaws pipe. You can see the stud link anchor chain attached. You can also see it attached to the port side anchor. What we've also got is one of the socket bases for the upright supports. For the flight deck, which projected out to this position, but which is now missing as it came out. You can also see we're at the very tip of the bow. As we move, as we continue to do this, and as we get to the point of shifting forward, at the tip of this bow would be a target that we would be interested in looking at when we get that opportunity. This is perfect right now. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is looking really good. It's amazing to see both of those anchors right there. It's a very impressive sight. If I may, I'm reminded that uh, by looking at the anchors here, that we're looking at the anchor deck, and the anchor deck was really the, the last refuge for many of the survivors on Akagi and, and where they directed the, um, the efforts, the firefighting efforts, as they tried to save their ship. I'm thinking it's like that. Yeah. That would make the most sense. So why don't we try looking movement down this way. Yep. Looking at it. 
So maybe we should try like a 10 meter move um, to try to get up to the bow. Uh, yeah, it's, let's, let me orient myself up there. Maybe. Almost south or 195? Is that what you're thinking? We're, we're kind of, yeah. So, wait, wait, this way, right? I believe so. Something like this. Yeah. So now that we're like that. It's like almost 225. Just bring it, bring it straight down. Yeah. I guess it could just go straight down, yeah. Just about at the, there, anyway. Yeah. We're still moving, I think, from the last Hey, Derek. Week. Yeah. Yep. Um, do we have any moves going, or are we still setting up? It looks like... It looks like Atalanta's catching up to the last move, which was put in at um, 155. So it's been about 15 minutes. Okay. If we could move, if we could, um, I'd like to move maybe, I don't know, 10 meters to the right, um, and then drop down and get a look at the bow. That's, fine. That's exactly what we were talking about. Yeah. So okay, I, great. I think that would be 10 meters bearing 180. Great. Sounds good. Thank you. That's my thought. Yeah. Bridge nav. To call in a ship move one zero meters at bearing one eight zero. Thank you. For any of our viewers that are just joining us here on Nautilus Live. We are conducting a non-invasive video documentation of Akagi, which is the aircraft carrier and the flagship for Japan's first air fleet. Um, this vessel sank during the Battle of Midway during World War II. And I'm trying to make sure that I know where we're looking at. I know we're looking at the bow right now, but are we on the port or star starboard part of the ship? Well, we were on starboard, and now the view you're mostly seeing looks like looks one like of the, the port, uh, right? deck supports is lying in the sediment um, just at the top of the screen. Oh, yeah, I see that. And by deck support, Mike, do you mean, um, was that something that helped hold up the, uh, I'm forgetting the word I'm looking for. It held up the flight deck. Flight yeah. deck, thank you. Looks like maybe another one as well. It's still attached to possibly parts of the deck. I don't know. It'll bear closer inspection when we get there, but I guess right off the bow is first. Thanks. This is kind of like uh, when you order food at a very busy restaurant, you put you put your order in it and then wait. Waiting for the ship to move, waiting for the ROV to come with it. But you know it's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, I can't quite hear you, Hans. You're not muted, are you talking? Yeah, you're talking, I don't know, you're weird. Come on. All right, let me adjust to him. Can you guys hear him? Yeah, can I can hear me? him. Oh, I'm not listening to SPL, that's why. Hey, there you are. <laughs> I don't know how that got turned off. Probably because I thought it was the mute button again. Guilty, I've done that also. Yeah, it's, well, it's different from the old units, so I keep pushing the, the far right button, but it's another far right button. This is a very narrow bow, huh? Yeah, very pointed. I'm like, Hans, speak up, and everyone else is like, you're too loud. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Mm 
I'm not sure where that hissing noise is coming from. Do you hear it? Yeah, it's nav. Okay. It's nothing. It's just this. I don't know why. I think. I think I have all the air on right now. Also that. Oh, yeah. Roger that. Yeah. Yep, that's it. <laughs> So I've heard that as we come around to the very, very front of the bow, uh, we are looking to see um, if there is a chrysanthemum press. Can one of our Japanese colleagues ashore share a little bit about what that represents and why that was placed? Oh yeah, please share that. I was wondering that. Hello, June. Are you still there? Uh, sorry. Um, what question again? I've seen in the plans and photographs that there is a chrysanthemum symbol at the very bow, the very bow of the Akagi's Hall. A beautiful chrysanthemum. Can you help us understand the, the meaning behind the chrysanthemum symbol? Oh, the, you mean the imperial one? Yeah. Yes. The uh, imperial crest. Is that uh, you're asking? Yes. We, we are looking yeah. to understand the meaning of the chrysanthemum symbol at the bow of the Akagi. Um, well... Yes, as, um, um, as um, most of yeah. you know, um, that represents uh, yeah. almost two two five interior mass. Yeah. And um, no history of it um, has a long history. Um, the particular flower yes. that was started to be used in uh, um, yeah, during the uh, Maybe 10. Question, what is the purpose of the chrysanthemum emblem? The um, Japanese warship at the time, uh, the chrysanthemum is considered ECC a... ECC team, uh, could you get a little closer to the mic? You're coming in a little muffled. Thank you. Um, the, the question was uh, something about the chrysanthemum emblem. The chrysanthemum is the sign of the, um, of, uh, the Japanese I believe, and most of the warships actually carried um, the chrysanthemum em em emblem on their bows to indicate they were property of the Imperial, the Imperial Majesty. So you'll oh, okay. see that on all Japanese warships. I think it's coming, kind of coming into view now. Symbols of royalty on warships go back centuries. And for the Japanese the Imperial Japanese Navy. Yeah, there it is. Chrysanthemum crest the bow, and there it is. You can yeah. see it. Uh, that that is the symbol of of an Imperial warship. This means this belongs to the Emperor. Japanese ships also carried a portrait of the Emperor, and when they were um, in danger of being lost in action, if you read some of the reports. You, especially those of the uh, four carriers at Midway, um, it is mentioned in the um, course in the course of tra radio traffic that the emperor's portrait was being removed from the ship, and at that point, um, that's when it ceased to be kind of a warship, 
and then it was acknowledged that uh, it was going to be lost. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah. And I agree. To, to add a little um, historical context, um, aloha to everyone, konnichiwa to our um, colleagues over in Japan. Um, also, our King Kalakaua visited Japan in 1881 and was personally presented by emperor there with the Royal Order of the Chrysanthemum. And so there's a long history of relationships between the Hawaiian Kingdom and um, Japan. So uh, there's a, you know, that really nice historical context about the chrysanthemum. And I'll talk more about those um, relationships that the Hawaiian Kingdom um, maintained with Japan um, over the years as we go through this uh, dive on the Akagi. Thank you, Malia. Watch lead. Yeah. Uh, do you want to try a slight move to try to get right, right in front of the? Bat? Yeah, I was just thinking that that'd be great. It'd be a really good shot to get things. Okay. I think that's pretty small. Maybe a five meter. Yeah. Okay. Bridge nap. I'm gonna turn to starboard a bit here, just to look. I'd like to do a five meter move. Yeah. At bearing 295. Yeah, I think that's some of the supports from the uh, flight deck that right. collapsed. Yeah, I was picking up sonar targets pretty close, so I just yeah. wanted to turn. Thank you. Mike, Hans? Yep. One of the... If we just went past that, the outline of the crest is there but the crest does not appear to be there. That's great. What that likely means is that this was a gilded piece of carved wood and that it has been consumed, but the location of it is still clearly defined there. When we get around to take a look, I think you see it clearly. Yeah, Jim, we're moving back to get more of a, a straight on approach to it. So Absolutely. We, we just have to move it. Pretty close to the we're just moving this way. Yeah. But this is also good to see the supports. I mean, it's I think you guys called it right. We have to kind of come up and look down while we get past there. Uh, this is really plowed in, but. So I have a question, and this can be for um, anyone here in the control van or our colleagues ashore, but the support beams that we're seeing, does this location of where they are next to Akagi tell us anything about when or how or why they came off? Well, they probably were um, loosened when the, when the flight deck um, was damaged. Uh, and my guess, since they're so close to the wreck, is that they fell off uh, upon impact with the seabed. Mm -hmm.
So for those viewers just joining in, we are on the Nautilus, the exploratory vessel Nautilus. We are currently in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. And the expedition name is Ala Aumoana Kaiuli, the path of the deep sea traveler. And as you can see, we are deep within the sea, looking at the Imperial Japanese Navy Akagi, aircraft carrier Akagi. That's an impressive amount of displacement of bottom sediment when the vessel finally hit the bottom and landed. Yeah. And pushed that all aside. That's higher than I thought it would be. It's, um, sometimes with the angle of the sea floor the beam you don't pick up the beams yeah but you'll see it come down to what it really is it's like eight meters every once in a while So I'm looking at this cable that's hanging down and I'm noticing what looks like uh, maybe some biological life forms and they look kind of similar maybe to what we were seeing yesterday. What do you uh, think about nudging it five more? Yeah. Whoa. Oh, there's just the TV. Weird. Bridge nav. We call in a ship move five meters, bearing two nine five, please. Thank you. Yeah. Can we zoom in on that cable hanging over the side, just to see if we can identify that biology? Yep, Ed, go for zoom, whenever. What do you think, Sebastian, and enemies? Um, yeah, I'm definitely thinking that Mies, um definitely looks like the same species that dominated the USS Yorktown's wrecks. They seem to be consistently occupying kind of the same type of areas on the ship. So my, mainly the edges of the, do of the decks and any kind of more narrow features like these chains, railings, etc. Uh, but yes, they do appear to be the same species, are very closely related. I thought I saw a couple sponges as well. I do think I see what might be a Bolosomidae species of glass sponge on the chain to the right, kind of sticking up there. Um, but I'm not quite sure, because it's a little bit more on the translucent side, and it might be a little bit thinner, but it might just be a young one. Thanks. Of course. Thank you for the zoom. I can come wide.
Hans and Mike, what's your druthers now? I think we should drive along the port side and head towards the um, area of the, of the island? No, we're trying to square up to get a better shot of the uh, crest. Understood. Uh, Dr. Tirubak? Yes, June? Uh, question, Ali, what type of wood that um, were used for the wood bags? Um, not 100% sure, but um, um, a few resources say uh, um, the Taiwan uh, Cyprus was used um, for the Yamato or the Philippine Kure shipyard. So um, for Atagi, uh, the wood from Taiwan, Taiwan Sapa, um could be used uh, for the wood deck. Thank you for that. Thank you, June. And I also appreciate your earlier comments about the torpedoes. Um, I think those were well known as quite effective. As you know, at that time, I don't think we had anything that could match those Japanese torpedoes on board the Akagi. It was huge, um, almost twice as large as the bombs used um, to, for the air raid for the Midway Island. So um, it was quite huge, 12 years old. Yes, very large. Um, Hans or Mike, would you folks be able to explain um, to the viewers and to those of us in the control room the significance of this um, vessel as a flagship and uh, what that meant? Yeah, so um, this was the ship that for the Pearl Harbor attack um, carried Admiral Yamamoto, uh, who was the mastermind behind it. And uh, he was on, on board the battleship Nagato for the Midway uh, operation. Um, and it was Admiral uh, Nagumo who, who was on uh, this ship during the Midway. Um, but the flagship j means that it carries the Admiral and is, is the lead ship in the fleet. Mahalo for that. Mike is one of the resident history nerds here. I have to... <laughs> chime in and say that uh, actually Admiral Nagumo was on Akagi for both Pearl Harbor and Midway. Uh, uh, Admiral Yamamoto was aboard uh, Battleship Nagato during oh. the Pearl Harbor attack and the, oh, okay. commanded the Midway mission from uh, Yamato. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, that's right. Thank you. I got that wrong. Thanks for that clarification. That's why I keep Russ around. One of the uh, interesting stories about Akagi is after she was hit and the fires began to rage um, and the uh, Japanese officers on the bridge abandoned the bridge because of the approaching fire, um, they could not, the only way they could escape was climbing up through one of the bridge windows and down to get away from the fire. And can you imagine Admiral Nagumo, a flag officer, having to do that? Um, it's a, a pretty sobering story. Yeah. And again, I mean, we're, this is about, and this is where 90, 90 survivors mm -hmm. uh, and took, took shelter. Of the four carriers at Midway, of, of the four Japanese carriers at Midway, only Akagi commanding officer, Aoki, survive the battle. 
That's... Oh. Oh, me either. That's fine. Thank you for sharing that. I just wanted to clarify. I think I heard you say that there were 90 survivors. Was that right? Not total. There were more than that. Mm -hmm. Earlier, it was noted that some 90 or so had taken shelter at the bow. But oh, there were okay. more survivors. Okay. Thank you. Are we... Uh, 1,030 oh. people on boat, and the uh, total number of the loss uh, was 267. Thank you, June. What are you thinking, Derek? Uh, I think we're still moving over there. Um, just trying to figure out where we're going after that. Yeah, I think we could... Um, it's been 10 minutes since the last move. Sorry. Yeah, I think as far as what we do after this, I think we can do kind of like a little... a move maybe at a, a little bit stronger of an angle to get over to the... the uh, port side or the right, but now the right side of the of the wreck, uh, and then continue our deck edge inspection. We're going to go along the bow deck, as I mentioned, and then once we hit the uh, the, the side wall, when the the hangar deck appears again, we're going to move up to the uh, to the edge of the flight slash hangar deck and uh, inspect up there back uh, to the to the island. Okay, sounds good. Do you think there's any hazards below? Oh, probably. Um, right yeah. at where we are right now. Right below? now, no. no, I don't think so. I've looked down a few times and turned around and... Yeah. Uh, do you want to try a zoom on the bow? Yeah, please. We okay. can maybe drop down a little bit more too. Dropping down. All right, Ed, whenever you're ready. Yeah, I think Jim's correct that it's the, the actual seal has been uh, deteriorated. It was probably made of wood. I don't know. I can I can convince myself it's still there and just covered, but I don't probably isn't. Actually, it still might be there. What do you think? Hard to tell. I'm wondering why it's reflecting like that. Because I can see the ridges in it. It's tough. Yeah, you yeah, know, if there was a protective surface over it that has yeah. now got some growth, but I see a flower shape yeah, inside there. Yeah, it's definitely there. there. I do see it. Yeah. So there may there. have been some sort of surface over it protecting it from weathering. It yeah. may still be wood and behind that, but yeah, I think yeah, it's there. closer yeah. inspection, I see the petals. Yeah. Great. And that's what's making the reflection, whatever protective surface they have. I think it was painted gold. Yeah. To the something. That's 
Yes, it is painted by gold color, I think. Originally. You can see the radiating lines of the petals. Yeah. Thanks, guys. That was worth the, uh, the patience. Absolutely incredible. So would that be like a final confirmation that we are looking at the Akagi? Uh, no, because all of the Imperial uh, ships had this crest. Uh, what was the final confirmation for me, at least, was that we did not see the uh, the, the c command tower with the bridge, the island, on this side of the vessel, because Akagi was unusual that it had it on the port side. Uh, and oh. so when we came down the starboard side, it wasn't there. And it, we will likely see it on the on the next side that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. the only other aircraft carrier, I believe, that had that was a Hiryu. Um, so th that that orientation is, is uh, you know, confirms this as uh, Akagi. I agree. And I don't know if we had a chance to share this yet, but if you're shared in that it was Kiki Day in Japan yesterday, a celebration of the chrysanthemum flower and its symbolism for the royal family and the chrysanthemum throne. So uh, really special to be able to be seeing and celebrating this symbology and its history for the nation. Well, the history of the symbol used by the Imperial family dates back to the even uh, meeting. The Imperial, uh, Imperial family started to use the Zetaphon as a symbol of the Imperial family. And today, um, like a um, the Japanese passport uh, still use the flower on the cover of the passport, Japanese passport. Mm -hmm. uh, very special flower. I agree. Thank you, June. Thank you for sharing that, the significance of the chrysanthemum in the uh, Japanese culture. Bridge mm -hmm. nap. Kukum Whitehead, as we are going to prepare for our next move, trying to get an idea of where we're at. I'd like to do a ship move, mm -hmm. three zero meters, bearing five five. Correct, thank you. Yep, 30 meters, bearing 55 degrees. Sure.
when we get over them, it'll be nice to see those supports and what they're connected to again that are lying in the sediment near the bow. We've been having a discussion on the effects of these large aircraft carriers falling through the water column and what that does to a flight deck and how much force those decks take and whether pieces can actually break off. And yesterday during the survey of the USS Yorktown, we saw the large sections at the stern, at the, at the, uh, over the fantail of the missing flight deck and it didn't look like it was in the vicinity. But seeing these supports from the forward part of the Akagi's flight deck right next to the wreck means that they didn't come off s somewhere too far up in the water column. They came off relatively close to this site, if not right at the moment of impact, which is maybe likely. So. From the point of view of an archaeologist, that all falls into the category of site formation processes and is part of the explanation for why things look the way they do after the entire wrecking event. Thank you, Hans. It's incredible to think about you know, the concussive force of this coming down to the seabed. So certainly, you know, we have one glimpse of this 81 years later and to piece back that history of events that unfolded and impacted the ship during the battle and during the fires and then during the sinking and then during the seafloor impact. And, you know, there's a lot to, a lot to unfold there, a lot to pull apart. What about that is particularly challenging or exciting for you or for any of our archaeologists, is it is it that unfolding story, or what part of this you know really draws you to this work? All of it. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I am. Uh, I lean towards the history side. So you know, as a historian and maritime archaeologist, I tend to. Uh, you know, I, I like the details of site formation. To me, it sometimes seems a bit nerdy, though. But, uh, you know, it, it's not just the combat itself and the major battles, but all the rest of it that we see evidence of in sites like this, the efforts to save these ships, the places that the survivors escaped to, the last moments, you know, this, this was not sunk as part of the battle. This was scuttled by four Japanese destroyers, each firing one torpedo to send the Akagi to the bottom of the ocean. Davy Jones Locker in the parlance of, of Western historians. And that's a part of the story that isn't usually told. And I think we saw elements of that on the Yorktown as well, particularly striking elements in the examples of where the Yorktown's crew was cutting away and jettisoning the uh, anti-aircraft guns, some which weighed only 400 pounds. And to do that, for the crew to be throwing over anti-aircraft guns that weighed 400 pounds in an attempt to write the increasing list of an aircraft carrier is testimony to the, the desperate need and desire they had for a crew to save their own ship in their last moments. It's quite striking. So in that way, evidence like that from the wreck site, the archeology, span in other words, fills in gaps in the historical narrative in the story. And it's not always just related to the actual attack of the aircraft, but what sailors do, what any ship's crew would do in uh, moments of catastrophe. Thank you, Hans. I think it's so important we remember these as, as the homes of people, as the workplace, you know, times, times of joy, times of terror, certainly times of loss and of sacrifice as well, but the ships were the pride of, of nations and the pride of so many people who spent, so many young men who lived their lives and worked on them. 
That's right. It's easy to imagine sailors on board the Akagi being very proud to be on board the flagship at this, you know, momentous event. And it's easy to imagine the sailors on the Yorktown being also very proud to be members of their ship and identify with that ship. And that's so important, that, that human element, you know, that connection that we have as humans, no matter what country or uh, boundaries that separate us, the ocean actually connects us. And um, I wanted to share an olelo no eao, um, because we are in a Hawaiian place. Um, we are in Papahanao Mokuakea and Aina Akua. Uh, this is a place where we originated as, as indigenous people and the place where we return to after our death. And so having um, the Akagi and um, other uh, wrecks from World War II, um, you know, we can understand this as native Hawaiians and the, the depth and the reverence that we hold for this place and for those who lay in the realm of Kanaloa, the, the god of the sea. Um, you know, I just wanted to share this olelo no eau. It's a, a Hawaiian proverb, and it says, Lu'u lu'u hanakahi ika ua nui. Weighted down is hanakahi by the heavy rain. And this expression was much used in Hawaiian laments for the dead to express that heaviness of the heart as tears that pour like rain. And so we honor those who, who gave the ultimate sacrifice whether you were um, American or Japanese, we honor those that lay in the realm of Kanaloa, our sacred Aina Akua, and uh, we are in reverence as we view um, this, the Akagi. That's very beautiful. Mahalo, Malia. Thank you so much for sharing that, Malia. Wisdom, all cross culture, knows no bounds here in how we reflect these pla on these places, our work here. Just an update from navigation. Um, yeah, the ship has done that last 30 meter move and we should be seeing some response. We're starting to move with Atalanta as you can see in the imagery. So yeah, we're trying to move up along the deck line that you see on the right of the image, which is actually the port side of the vessel. That's right, thank you. Sure. Mike's taking a dinner break, but that's that's the plan for those watching. We're moving Atalanta slowly to the upper right, and we'll be proceeding aft on the port side of the Akagi. In this image, the bow is beneath us, and the rest of the ship is ahead of us towards the top. We're looking at the battle cruiser deck. The vessel was originally built as a battle cruiser and then converted to an aircraft carrier. So as we continue this move along the port side, we'll come back to 
the superstructure of the hangars, and they're several stories above this battle cruiser deck, so it's prudent for us to remain a bit elevated and continue our move. And we're about halfway there. Halfway through our move? Yep. Okay. We just moved about 15 meters. Yeah. We got 15 more to go. It's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> exactly. And speaking of marathons, also just wanted to give people a, a heads up. So this is going to be, uh, we're going to got quite a bit of more time here. We've got about 14 hours more of bottom time. So we'll probably be able to get the whole way around and do all the close-ups that we need to. Uh, then it's going to be a three hours to the surface and a four hours to our next uh, deployment. But the plan is then to deploy on the uh, site of the Kaga, uh, where we'll do a 24-hour uh, dive as well. Uh, so plenty more exploration, and that's just the beginning. Uh, this is, we're about midway now through our 27-day expedition to the Papahanam Kuakiamari National Monument, exploring some of the greatest sites uh, in deep water of this great monument uh, that's been protected at the highest state, federal, and international loss because of its tremendous natural and cultural value and significance. And uh, yeah, we're getting at a glimpse at the archaeology, geology, and biology, uh, and all of its glory that this wonderful place has to offer. Front row, can we look back at the uh, the supports? Oh yeah, structure yep. to the right and zoom. And also, we notice clearly how much higher the sediment has been pushed on this port side of the vessel. Uh, as opposed to where we were when we came up the starboard side. Yeah, I have some interest in looking at that structure a little more closely. All right, uh, you want to zoom there, Ed? Yeah, I think I see, I mean, we're, we're assuming that these are pillars that held up the front part of the flight deck. And in plans, anyway, they had rungs on them. And I'm just wondering if I can see any of the rungs on this side. Maybe not, but it, this looks like all the structure that would be supporting the flight deck high above the cruiser's bow. Maybe all the pillars didn't have rungs. Can we look a little further right? Thank you. And left. Those are the shapes of the posts that are still on the cruiser's bow. So, yeah, those are the pillars. Thank you. All right, let's come back around. Hans, what would those pillars be made out of? Is that metal, concrete? I'm guessing steel. writing in, sharing what an emotional experience this is for them. I think that is so true for all of us. This is just a, you know, it sits heavy in the air. What a profound honor that this is um, for our team and approaching this with such reverence. Um, what is part of my joy, certainly, in being able to be here is, is being able to share this, having our colleagues 
from the Japanese embassy watching with us from our collaborators, archaeologists in Japan, June Kimura on the line with us now and others joining soon. Also just sharing this with the folks all around the world, the, the messages we receive. If you're watching over on YouTube, feel free to join us in community over on Nautilus Live. You can send in questions for the team. You can learn more about the voices that you're hearing on the team page, see people's profiles, uh, read a blog about the history of Midway. If this is the first time for you encountering this story. It is a story of um, tremendous turns of events and uh, a very pivotal moment as we think about the Pacific and about that particular era of time, how we connected and related to one another at that point. So welcome you to learn more about that history with us and as we also learn about these ships here. So I've uh, got a lovely note in from a viewer for Jim Delgado um, and Mike, one of our lead scientists, Hans, I know this extends to you that this year was inspired to become an explorer and to educate others by interacting uh, with you all as teachers. So thank you for sharing your knowledge with us here on board and with everybody around the world watching on Nautilus Live. Could I share a bit of information on the name of Akagi with Shoa team? Please, June, please do. Love to hear that. In early, um, uh, explained that um, the Akagi means uh, let uh, walls, let castles. And, uh, the character represents the meaning too. Um, the thing is, um, ours. Um, there is also mountains called Akagi Mountain in Japan, in Gunma prefectures. A number of um, um, Japanese Imperial Navy ships um, named after from that uh, name of the, uh, all the kingdoms and the mountains and the rivers. So Akagi uh, names uh, derive uh, from the name of the mountain, Akagi is in Patri. And um, yeah. so, um, the bit of a story, um, the, one of the crews from uh, Gumma Prefecture who probably used to watching the mountain, um, the reason that, uh, he was bought on Akagi is because uh, he's from the prefecture, the Hat Mountain. Uh, his lieutenant advised uh, the young crew um, the Akagi was a well-built ship, and um, uh, because that uh, uh, young crew from that um, uh, the region of Akagi Mountain, and Akagi was um, uh, would be probably never sunk, and um, it was very because of the, um, the constructions were built. Um, but um, yeah, he died on board, and his his uh, younger brother. Um, I remember the conversation with his older brother uh, who lost on the boat. Yeah, so that was. Thank you, June. Amazing yeah. to imagine a ship this big, and, and I totally understand the connection of seeing it as a mountain.
for folks watching, we're beginning to get back to the point where we see the, the forward edge of the enclosed hangar decks. There's been quite a bit of damage and, and tearing of the steel, but um, we're right at the part where those hangar decks uh, made it to the forward part of the ship. They were on supports themselves, so the battle cruiser's deck continued beneath them, and there was an open gap between the bottom of the hangar decks and the cruiser deck still. So as we gaze at the wreckage um, from the Battle of um, Midway in 1942, I wanted to um, give some a little bit of historical context on um, the relationship that Japan and the Hawaiian Kingdom um, initiated in 1871. So the Hawaiian Kingdom and Japan actually had a treaty of amity and commerce um, and that's where they created a formal diplomatic relationship. Um, in 1881, King David Kalakaua was the first head of state to circumnavigate the globe, and he visited Japan. And when he visited Japan, he was hosted magnificently by the royal family of Japan, and he was... Um, given the supreme order of the chrysanthemum, which is the highest order um, that the Japanese um, imperial family gives out. And so this um, relationship between um, the Hawaiian Kingdom and Japan um, has been long, and it's been fruitful. We've had many immigrants that have come to Hawaii who worked on the plantation systems here, and um, Japanese culture is an integral part of um, Hawaii and the Japanese people. And um, I think that, you know, despite the um, being oppositional foes during World War II, um, the healing can take place when we, we look at, you know, the wrecks of battles. We can understand that war is tragic and that so many lives are lost, but that we can move beyond that. And I think this project has um, really shown that collaborative kind of collective effort to look at history and hopefully learn from history so that none of our sons or our grandsons or granddaughters will ever have to lay at the bottom of Kanaloa from a war. So history is a powerful teacher if we're willing to learn from that.
Thank you, Malia. So agree. And I also want to, you know, ce celebrate the ways that the United States and Japan very quickly after the war began to uh, repair that relationship and today work closely together, you know, moving on 80 years can be both a long time and a very short amount of time in the history of the world. And so to have so quickly, you know, gained so much closeness again, I think is also a remarkable part of this story. Agreed. And thank you Shoreside team and thank you John Parshall who is uh, giving us important input via somewhat of a pseudonym on the science chat, I would say, but uh, thank you, John. That's an interesting diagram. He uh, has obviously identified the forward end of the hangar deck, and the diagram he sent also shows ladders that were going up to the catwalks at the forward end of these upper hangar decks above the cruiser's bow. And I think we saw one of those ladders when we were moving aft slowly beneath us. And uh, also, John notes that the upper and lower hangar decks, which were beneath the flight deck, at this forward end would have been where the Mitsubishi A6M fighter aircraft would have been stored, the Zeros. Yeah, Malia, thank you so much for sharing those beautiful words earlier. Just wanted to share a little bit of perspective here, too. You know, we are north of Midway Atoll, uh, kind of midway between the coasts of uh, the western coast of the United States and Japan. Uh, so po people probably don't realize that we're actually quite far north. We're technically not in the tropics here anymore. Um, I was privileged to uh, previously get to do some uh, diving closer to shore here and do a lot of surveys closer to the, some of the reefs. Uh, and it's interesting and in many ways here also the fauna, you start seeing a lot of uh, tropical reef fauna that's closer to, to Japan, uh, you know, a lot of similarities. And uh, yeah, I think that the ocean connects us in many ways. Uh, and it's an powerful emulsifier that brings people together uh, particularly true here in the in the Pacific Islands, uh, where we're, uh, the ocean connects us all. Mia, are we continuing a ship move? Yeah, we're almost done with the last call that was made. Okay, thank you. 
I think the plan is, you know, while uh, Mike is grabbing some food to continue down the port side. All right. Let me check in with Dan. Hans, if we continue down the port side, the thing that we would want to do is probably you can think it will stay at this altitude and do, as opposed to a mud line. And the, some interesting stuff in the sonar, you know, see what's left of the island. If, is it standing? Did it fall over? Is it gone? Uh, all of that. We're also, that'll give us a chance as well to look in the gun gallery, look at the, you know, look at the guns in the tubs, the directors, all of that. Yep, that sounds like the plan. Thank you, Jim. Here's a question for Shoreside investigators. So if we're this high up at the forward end of the hangars, are we looking at portions of the flight deck again being blown out and bent over, or is this a lower deck? Well, we were actually thinking, of, we were talking about that as well. I mean, one of the things, I mean, I think what we're looking at here with all this wreckage down in the lower left-hand corner is the forward bulkhead of, of the hangar. And with that, uh, what we're likely looking at is not the, um, I think that's the overhead of the hangar. The actual, I mean, when you look at the blueprints, it's like, it's like its own. The hangar is kind of cantilevered over the deck. Um, remember that, um, like American carriers designed to the, the, everything above the, the main deck is a superstructure. So the, the two hangars for economy and for flight deck are superstructure. So you could, if you look especially towards the bow end, you can see there are these like three large supports holding up the, the hangar deck above the main deck. And we think that what we're looking at is that structure that's kind of collapsed down a little bit. And the flight deck would have been above this, Hans. Um, so I think, I think that what we're looking at is that it's not really a deck, it's more like an overhead. But I mean, like the whole thing fell down. Because I mean, we didn't see when we came alongside, we didn't see these supports, did we? Like, we're we like, did not. Know. Like maybe they sheared or buckled, but and you see this buckling here. I think we're looking at the, we're looking at hangar structure, um, and I think the flight deck was directly on top of this. Those ladder runs that are 10 to 20 meters aft is where we are now. I didn't want to interrupt you guys talking, but I, I did just put in another uh, ship move for 30 meters. Thank you, Mia. You're welcome. Thank you, shore team. Since we're here, can we get a zoom there? Or are we too close to that, uh, that infrastructure? No, you can zoom. Hey, Hans. Zoom's Frank free. thinks that that might be a plane that's flying there. Like a Look, yeah. Is that full zoom? Possible to pan down a little? Roger. Not sure what you're, uh, what you're after there. There we are. Looking at the hatch. Yeah, that looks like a hatch. Thank you.
Did you did you tell Atlanta that we moved the ship? Just want to make sure everyone's in the loop. It takes a while for the message to get uh, 5,337 meters down the wire, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, Atalanta sometimes has a mind of its own. It's uh, I've been sitting here for 20 minutes and it hasn't. I haven't really seen it move, and we've done uh, two ship moves since I've been sitting here. Someone's going to get a stern talking to when they get back on deck. Hans. Not by me. <laughs> I'm too nice of a guy. I wouldn't do it. And to thank you, John Parshall. Uh, he's given us further input. It's very interesting. And John notes that after Akagi was, was bombed, there was a large explosion. Uh, several hours later, one of those induced explosions from the amount of uh, torpedoes and bombs and fuel on the hangar decks. And that explosion blew out the forward end of the hangar directly above the anchor deck. At the time, there was a large manual pump in operation, and that was pretty much the only source of water for the firefighting. Very interesting to note. Thank you, John. I'm going to hand it back over to Derek. You guys have a great rest of your watch. Thanks, Mia.
Welcome to viewers that have recently joined us. Currently we are looking at Are y'all able to hear me a bit better now? Kind of? Yep, I can hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, for viewers that are just tuning in with us, um, we are currently viewing and looking at the Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Akagi. Um, and we are conducting a non-invasive video documentation. And I just want to recognize how special this moment is for a lot of our viewers tuning in. A lot of folks are sharing stories and connections that they have with this place um, and stories about their family members. And I want to encourage folks that are viewing to join us over at nautiluslive.org. And if you have a story or a question that you would like to share, you have the ability to type in the chat for us to see. And when we have a moment, um, we will maybe be able to answer some of those questions. But seeing some of the messages that y'all are sharing about, especially your family members and just honoring those that have lost their lives in this area is uh, really special and really important. And we are currently diving with ROV Atalanta, and Atalanta can reach depths up to 6,000 meters. And I see some folks are asking about ROV Hercules, and usually we use Hercules in a dual body system with a tow sled ROV like Atalanta. Um, and Hercules can reach about t or up to 4,000 meters. So we are deeper than that right now, um, viewing this site together, and it's just so amazing and incredible to see the responses that a lot of you are sharing with us as we watch this together. Thanks, Sarah. I want to give a, a quick update to uh, how we're doing um, and, and what the plan is going forward. Um, so we just, we've rounded the bow and we're back to the, um, the beginning of the hangar deck. Uh, given that there's been a number of uh, scary pokey things uh, sticking off of the top of the carrier at the damaged deck. Um, it's probably not safe for us to do the second um, 360 uh, along the mud line. So instead of doing the flight deck and then the mud line, I think what we're going to do is go along the flight deck and periodically drop down to take a look at um, the hull at the mud line and see if we can find torpedo damage. Um, but for the most part, stay up at the flight deck um while we're moving after that'll take us a little bit longer but honestly it's more efficient because we won't be doing two full 360s of ship moves uh, which are taking the longest um, after that we'll probably fly over the uh the top of the wreck from uh, stem to stern and look at the the the, the deck uh, top down and then we'll survey the debris field around it we concur we concur we're yeah. good Thanks, Jim. Well, Bill said he concurred to add the plane. Derek, do we know what that big bright sonar return is to the right? Uh, I don't think we do Looks yet, like do we? Yeah, we, have, no, we haven't gotten it. That, that could be yeah. scary too, fun times. It's about 25 meters off. Okay. Yeah, that's something to keep an eye on. <clears throat> You want to scan up for any overhead cables or? Yeah. And a little update on our last move. We're about 20 meters into a 30 meter move, so we got about 10 meters okay. left to go. Yep. And that's on bearing 55 degrees. All right, sounds good.
Yeah, so is that, is that blocking our way, the target, like, uh, right, See, right about, about now? it's about 20 meters, 20 meters off. Still can't, <clears throat> still can't really see it. Only the sonar. We might end up having to go up and over that and then drop down the other side. Yep. yep. Uh, we had a, a viewer, uh, John, wrote in um, saying that there's nothing worth seeing at the mud line on the port side because the scuttling torpedo hits are on the starboard side. Okay. Um, that's really good to know. I think I might still want to drop down in a few places just to. Look at how buried it's, how deeply it's buried, and just get a general sense of the wreck. But uh, that is good information. We'll we'll double our efforts on the starboard side. I think a lot of that damage is going to be buried, though, similar to Yorktown. This damage here in front of us, what is that? Really? Uh, I think that's the collapsed deck uh, okay. on top of the bow structure. I think once we get, uh, so we're looking like down the wreck, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think. Um, we're going to get a little further, and um, well, I'm, I'm actually not entirely sure if we're on up on hangar deck or if we're still on bow, but I'll figure it out eventually. I think I see the actually I think I see the edge of the deck uh, forward. Like there's that ladder or steps there, yeah. and I think the deck pops out uh, to the right. might want to go a little more, like, like a 65 bearing, if okay. we go at another 30 meters, just to, if the yeah. ship's widening out. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. 65. Is there a 55 I'm looking, right now? Yeah, 50, 55. So this would be 65. What do you think? Do you want more than that? I just don't want to get too far away. I think 6.5 would be okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're coming up on this obstruction. Just about able to see it. Yeah, that's what's causing the uh, that blip in the sonar. Yeah, that's that sonar target. Bridge nav. I'd like to do a ship move three zero meters at sixty five degree bearing. Correct, thank you. Correct, yep.
Uh, for our new viewers, could you um, let us know what portion of the ship we're looking at again? Yeah, we're um, we just uh, slightly b uh, aft of the of the bow where where the uh, flight and hangar deck started up again. I think this um, <clears throat> we're looking up in the the background. We see this like large lattice structure. I think that's a piece of the flight deck that broke off, uh, and it's leaning. We're gonna have to like do some fun maneuvering around that. Up and over. Thank yeah. you. And like, after, you're looking at the, um, it's peeled up and off and off to the side. That's that big sonar we That's what? This is what you were seeing in the sonar. Yeah. That's, that's a section of flight there. Yeah. Yeah, it was peeled back. And we're looking, we're looking at the underside of it. Yeah. I think this is the part of the flight deck that was over the, uh, over the front part near the bow. It probably uh, peeled back in the water on its way down. Yep, and we are moving um, from bow towards the stern on the port side currently. Thank you. Oh yeah, I guess that's the quicker answer. Well, we got a long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a long way to go. Yeah. Jake, I'm almost thinking the heading you're looking at now might be the way to proceed down the line. Zero four five? Yeah. And a question from our viewers, perhaps for Jun or one of our <clears throat> Japanese colleagues. Um, would the Japanese warships also have their names on their hull anywhere? Uh, we don't know that for sure. Uh, the plans show that they might have had their names on the stern, and we'll take a look but we're not sure. We, we haven't seen any photographs that show that. Okay, thank you. When we dove on the Kaga back in 2019, we did not see any evidence of a ship name on the stern. And it would have been in the Japanese character, not, not anyone. We didn't see any evidence of that. In the chat, John screenshotted that ladder. Nice. Yeah. John says the Kagi has her name on the stern, I'm pretty sure. All right, we'll take a look okay. there when we get there in like, you know, 36 hours from now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Soon enough. <laughs> No, but I mean, if, if John says it, yeah. So, we yeah, look. It's good to know. So, Mike, we just, we've got ourselves like a big tub of, of black coffee. Ah, uh, nice. And, but this is, this is keeping us all awake. We haven't really drawn that much on it. Pilot, watch lead. If you guys think it's a good idea, I'll go ahead and just keep keep putting in the next move. Yeah, as long as you guys are comfortable going up and over. Yep. Okay. 
just gonna drop a target here. I think that, I think as we're moving past here, just past the field back deck, we might be looking down at the top of a gun director. Yeah, I see that in the distance. Bridge nav. I'd like to do a ship move, please. We're in the box. Three zero meters at four or five degrees. Thank you. Mike, if that's the director, we would be moving up in an area and the plans would be coming up to uh, where one of the ship's boats was. Yeah. When the launches. I uh, have That obstruction pretty much right below us at this point. Yep. Yeah. That main surface we're looking at right now, is that the flight deck? Or is that the deck below where the flight deck I, used to I be? I think it, it could, I think it might be the hangar deck. Um, because it is lower than, I think what we're looking at at the, the top of the screen might be the remnants of the flight deck. Oh yeah. So I think the one below it is the hangar deck. Well, you can see where you've got flight deck, and that you've got more of the burden structure there. This yeah. is more solid oh, hangar. You think there's any chance we could image a plane on the deck, on the hangar um, deck? I don't think the hangar deck's all that intact either, because you can see the hole to our left is in both decks. Um, I really can't speak to what might be inside. That's one of the things that we're going to check out after we do the 360. I think the greatest chance of finding an aircraft would be in the debris field around it. Okay. There's there's one target off the bow that uh, I see in the sonar from 2019 that I'll for sure have us check out. But patience. <laughs> That'll be like tomorrow. Well, you can definitely see two deck levels here. Yeah. Oh yeah, John says that if there were aircraft still on the hangar deck, they'd be melted down to aluminum slag because uh, the, the fires were raging for so long. 
So actually, yeah, there may not be a chance of finding aircraft here at all because there wouldn't have been any still on board that could have fallen off when it sank. But we'll still look through the debris field. Oh, and he says there are only two zeros on the deck when she was bombed, so there's probably zero chance of finding aircraft. Yeah. Wah, wah. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, I know. That's good to know so we're not uh, spending time looking around. I mean, we'll still look at the debris field, but hopes appropriately managed. <laughs> so we're looking at flight here and see the curve. Yeah. Curve. That might be for an elevator. Yeah, I think we're. At, I think. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I think we're at the um, the forward elevator. Because we were seeing that in the sonar, or actually we're still seeing that in the sonar. See, so yeah, Jim, that makes sense. Derek, once we finish this move, if we're not quite. Uh, off the edge to the right, we'll probably want to move a another step or two back just to, so we can get uh, down and look at the uh, the decks. Uh, back towards the bow or back off the off of the. Uh, uh, back off of the. To, to the right. Okay. Yeah. yeah but you. we'll see where we end up.